Hey, Vince McMahon, it's time for this week's Stick to Wrestling podcast. Oh, no, give me a break. Oh, brother. Welcome, everyone, to the first edition of Stick to Wrestling for the year of 2023. My name is John McAdam. This is Stick to Wrestling. It is a weekly classic pro wrestling podcast coming at you every week if you give us 60 minutes perhaps indeed we'll give you a wicked good and raw bone podcast before we get moving i want to invite you first of all to uh, follow me on twitter if you put in the name john mcadam and follow the guy who has the stick wrestling logo as his avatar uh follow me and we'll be good to go i i i need the ego boost and secondly you're invited to join our facebook group uh, it just search stick to wrestling and I will put you right in. First of all, if you're part of the Facebook group, you know that a, I went out of 2022, uh, listing the best albums from like 1972, 1982, 1992. We do not strictly stick to wrestling. It's a really cool group and secondly if you listen to the podcast and you're not part of the facebook group you are not aware that 2023 was going to bring in a change to stick to wrestling and it's a good change it's not it's like if you're living in a house and you love living in the house and everything's cool about it that's stick to wrestling for you every week right but then now we're building an in-ground pool in addition to the house it's going to make it better i would like to introduce our new semi-regular co-host, Mr. Steve Generelli. If you're if you've been listening to the show, you know Steve. Steve, welcome to your new role. <laughs> Thank you, John. It's very uh, very nice of you to invite me. Um, I would say that this was the biggest mystery in wrestling since who's coming out of the egg at Survivor Series, <laughs> and uh, right now I kind of feel like uh, Hector Guerrero coming out of the egg. But uh, you know, it's really a great honor to be invited and. Uh, I am a big fan of the show, and I've been on a few times already, and uh, thank you so much for the invite. No, I I actually have a second big announcement. I have a really bad cold. I've been fighting it for like the last three days. So if I'm not 100% voice-wise, please forgive me, everyone. Uh, but let me explain what the, the next f- – Moving forward with Stick to Wrestling and Steve as the semi-regular co-host is going to be like, sometimes the show is going to be just Steve and I. Like today, for example, first show of 2023. Sometimes it's going to be me, Steve, and a guest joining us. You'll have three people as part of the podcast. That's what we plan on doing seven days from now. Uh, sometimes it's just going to be the guest and I. If Steve and I have a a scheduling conflict, we're going to look at, hey, no big deal. We'll see you next week. And sometimes, but not very often, it's just going to be me if I have a ton of audio and Steve and I have a scheduling conflict. But like I said, Steve, you know, w- welcome to your new world, man. No, it's great. Uh, I, uh, you know, love wrestling, love the website, and uh, I'm a big fan of all the Arcadian Vanguard programs. So it's just really great to be uh, more involved and uh, get to, uh, you know, add my two cents to the production. Well, definitely. Thank you for for climbing aboard. The two biggest reasons Steve is in this position. Number one, uh, he and I are very similar. We started, we're about exactly the same age. We started wrestling, watching wrestling exactly the same time. But the other biggest thing is that Steve's schedule uh, has it so that he can record on weekdays sometimes during the week. And that's really important to me. And I know it, it doesn't make, make Steve sound like he's less than special talent wise, but that's that's certainly not the case. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to to tell all, all our fellow uh, listeners and friends that uh, uh, there's a lot of other great people that could have uh, had the role as well as well as I, I was fortunate enough to get it. But it was more of a case of just scheduling, and um, it wasn't like I was any better than anybody else. It was just more like I was maybe the best person for the schedule. So it kind of worked out good that way for me. Well, it, it, and it, it really wasn't just that, Steve. It's like, you know, you and I are, are very similar and, you know, we have a very similar pool of knowledge, I think. But another reason you want to join the Facebook group, if you have not done so already, this show is going to be a mailbag edition of Stick to Wrestling. And we are going to celebrate 
uh, me not being able to believe that 1993 was 30 years ago, and we're going to discuss wrestling topics from uh, 1993, the questions that people thrown at us. And I'm going to throw out one that wasn't even a question uh, from John Ware. And Steve, you'll understand this. John says, nope, nothing. I was completely checked out in 1993. And Steve, you, know, you were a fan back then. It felt like the pro wrestling game had kind of come to a crossroads. The WWF had a horrible 1992. I mean, their attendance cratered, their pay-per-view buy rates cratered, their their uh, ratings absolutely went down the tubes. WCW, it felt like they were never going, going to be able to figure it out. 30 years ago today, I mean, I, I personally had a bleak outlook on the future of pro wrestling. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it, I think it really had gotten to a scorched earth. It would be the term I would use. Uh, yeah, I think both both of the major companies had really hit rock bottom or close to rock bottom. Um, you know, I think it was a mixture of things. I think uh, you know, yes, the scandals played a role from the year before, uh, but I think also uh, you know, just a lot of overexposure. I mean, uh, you know, Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage were really exciting in '85 and '86. But when they're still on top in 91, 92, 93, not so much. Uh, they had really worn out their welcome. And, you know, you're not seeing a, a new face at the top of the card. And, and, you know, I give WCW and WWF credit in that they could see the writing on the wall. And if you look at the, the dates of those shows in 93, they actually did uh, – WWF did four European tours and WCW did – two European tours. So they realized that they couldn't make money here in the States uh, as well as they used to. They could still make some, but they had to go uh, overseas to make uh, make some good revenue. You know, people uh, really kind of flip, flip out sometimes when we refer to wrestling as, you know, looked like an 80s fad. And they're like, no, wrestling had been a, a staple in pro sports, you know, going back to the 50s, 60s and 70s. But 30 years ago, it felt like Vince McMahon's vision or his version of pro wrestling was an 80s fad that was going away. And guess what? The territories were not coming back. And it it really felt like, you know, wow, is, is wrestling going the way of roller derby? Yeah, and I think I think as you know, you and I are started off as predominantly WWF fans. You know, we 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 had the benefit uh, of uh, seeing. We'll, we use Bob Backlund as an example. You know, Bob Backlund would wrestle, uh, you know, Jesse Ventura and Adrian Adonis, and then they would go away, and then you'd have Superstar Graham and Ray Stevens come in, and then they would go away, and and you'd have this you know unending rotation of newcomers come in, and so that way wrestling was never boring. It was always exciting because you either had the these brand new stars, like a Bob Orton will say, a brand new star you had never seen before. And then you had the guys that you had seen maybe two or three years ago coming back, which always kind of made it fun. But now at this point, 1992, 93, the territories are dead. So you're getting a handful of new stars who are good, but <laughs> they're very limited. And you know, you're not getting the seasoned guys who had been to like seven or eight different territories and had learned from so many different trainers and exposed to so many different styles. And now you're, you're getting much more limited uh, talent. So it was really making uh, the wrestling landscape much more uh, dry and boring. Yeah, the, the, it became a lot more pronounced because, like you said, the territories were dead. Uh, I mean, Memphis was still going on fumes, but everyone else was literally gone. The WWF no longer had the option of just, you know, I mean, long gone were the days where the WWF could be like, oh, I need a new star. Well, who's in world class? Who's in, who's wrestling for Bill Watts? Who's in Florida? Like that was long gone in 93. And now you can't even really look at WCW and say, okay, who can we steal from them? Because guess what? They've already taken everyone from WCW. So now guys are going straight straight from really independence to the WWF. And that's a really big leap. And the WWF, you know, around this time, not even around this time, the whole time, you know, since Vince McMahon took over, he wasn't really good at creating his own stars. I mean, Honky Tonk Man, yes, Vince created that. Even if he didn't really create it, he's the one who brought it to the mainstream. Uh, Ultimate Warrior, same thing. 
Other than that, Vince was just borrowing from what other promotions had already established. And now, once again, that's way in the rear view. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the few new characters they try to create, I mean, uh, uh, Doink would be, uh, I guess, classified as a successful one, um, it, you know, controversial uh successful one and, and you know even that was just kind of ridiculous by his own merits but uh matt Bourne, being a really talented guy and kind of a weird guy uh, he really brought that to life but you you weren't getting like major stars that were just you know emerging and were really obvious to be no no this would be the next big thing i mean as time would go on uh, and maybe a, a year from now we'd see uh, or at the end of this year, we'd see Diesel kind of emerge out of nowhere. Uh, you know, he had been, you know, Vinny Vegas and WCW, and uh, he would he would quickly improve and become a valuable star for Vince. But you know, these types of wrestlers were just so few and far between as far as somebody who would, you know, acclimate to the wrestling and and really catch on with the audiences. The audience seemed very, uh, you know, hard to get excited about somebody brand new. And they were also tired of seeing the same old faces too. Yeah. I mean, they were stuck in a tough place. The undertaker was another uh, successful WWF creation, but now we're looking in, in 1992, you've got razor Ramon who turned out to be okay. But at first that was kind of rough. Uh, Papa Shango. I mean, people threw that right back at the WWF. Um, that was a big time turnoff for people. And like you said, doink the clown. And it's like, okay, we, we, Vince is so out of ideas. We now have, a, a wrestling voodoo man and a wrestling clown. It was just not not a very happy time 30 years ago, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right in that. And uh, um, I think this is a good time to transition to some other great questions that we have for the uh, uh, listening audience. Yes. And so, you know what, Steve, I would like you to select the first question that was asked. All right. Um, let's go with uh, Chris Tabor, who's been a great guest host before. Uh, he says, in terms of overall variety and quality worldwide, is 1993 the best year in wrestling ever? What do you think, Steve? <laughs> well, after what we just said, uh, I would say <laughs> yeah, really? probably not. Uh, and well, yeah, I, can, I mean, I, can I just throw this in really please. quick? I think Chris is mostly referring to All Japan and New Japan, who were both on fire in 1993. Uh, CMLL, the two Mexican promotions were definitely hot. But domestically, I, I, I can't go with 1993 because the U.S. scene, it just wasn't there. I, I, I would say, uh, in, in fairness to Chris, uh, and I don't know if he was one of these fans, but if you, let's say hypothetically, uh, Chris or anyone else was a brand new fan in 1993, had never seen wrestling before, uh, I'd say it's possible that you could watch some of this stuff. Uh, so we'll use Smoky Mountain as an example. Maybe the early incarnation of uh, ECW, uh, Eastern Championship Wrestling. Maybe somebody saw that and said, this is like unbelievably cool. You know, I really want to get into wrestling and I want to become a fan. But for the, for those of us like John and I, we'd been around since the mid to late seventies. Uh, it, it really had gotten to a really bad place. In my own opinion. You know, so to answer Chris's question, uh, 93 had some superb matches from Japan and Mexico, but I would go more with like a 1996 because Japan was still red hot, but now you've got WWF putting more emphasis on in-ring action with main events on pay-per-views with guys like Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart, and then you've got WCW uh, using the ECW and the, uh, the Japan and Mexico star, so you're getting solid matches were sometimes more than solid matches on the undercard there. And then again, you, you know, so basically you have a strong domestic scene match wise and you still have a great overseas scene. So I would go with 96. Yeah, I mean, and if you ask me or, or press me to answer on that as far as what would be your I would pick out. I mean, I, I really like, uh, you know, 1986 uh, because I think. You know, as, as, as a WWF fan, I'd say that was probably their best year work rate wise. I mean, you had, uh, uh, you know, the Hearts against the Bulldogs. You had Jake against uh, Steamboat. You had the Hogan against Orndorff, Savage against Santana. Some really, really high caliber matches. And, of course, uh, Dusty's NWA or Crockett 
was going gangbusters with Midnight Express, or Ric Flair, some of his best matches. And plus, you know, Japan was riding high with Ricky Koshu and uh, Fujinami. I mean, it was really great all over the world in 86. So that would probably be the would probably get my vote. Well, okay, I could I could definitely see that. 80, you know, I thought both Japan promotions were stronger in the early to mid 90s, but which is not to say that they were weak in 1986. I mean, Akira Maeda was having fantastic matches. He looked like the the next big thing. All Japan had the best, you know, foreign talent, and that's what they were called. So, yeah, I, I mean, 86 is also an excellent pick. And we haven't even mentioned the NWA with the Midnights and the Rock and Roll and Ric Flair and whoever else he's wrestling, sure. and Tully Blanchard, et cetera. Oh, yeah. And, and even UWF. UWF with Bill Watts was, oh, that's right. was phenomenal in 86. Probably the best TV show and, uh, you know, some of the hottest uh, feuds in wrestling. Uh, so, yeah, that, that was a really good year. But uh, why don't you ask me a question from 80, from 93? Well, I'll tell you what. I'll throw this question out there. I'm actually going to cheat a little bit. The, the questions overlap a little bit. One is from Christian Bodie. Is this the year the business became too far gone to salvage? And by that, I mean, had fans been angered by the WWF scandals and the overall lack of direction in the industry? Now, Danny Bentley's question kind of overlaps a little bit because I'm going to talk about this. Do you think Yokozuna winning the title at WrestleMania 93 and being overshadowed by Hogan winning the title immediately after Vince moved was to show Hogan that he wanted him to stay or was it a Hogan ego trip? My initial reaction, Steve, when I read Christian's question I said, no, that was 1992, in my opinion, that, you know, that was too far gone to salvage. And then I thought about it. Coming into 1993, the WWF still had a couple of real possibilities, a couple of bats on the bench, if you will, as to, okay, how can the WWF make its business rebound? Option number one, the Hulk Hogan comeback. Now, Hogan stepped aside after WrestleMania 8 because of the ongoing scandal, uh, steroid scandal, and the fact that, you know, he kind of got caught using. The plan was for him to come back SummerSlam 92, but things were still hot by then. And now we have a, we finally get Hulk Hogan back. And that's one possibility where the WWF could rebound. And to throw in Danny's question, to me, if you're going to go with, okay, we're going to bring back Hulk Hogan, we're going to make him the number one guy, that's the that's what you have to do. You have to push Hulk Hogan, even though you accept the fact that it's not going to be 1984 Hulk Hogan anymore. It's not going to be 1987 Hulk Hogan. You're probably not even going to get 1991 Hulk Hogan. But coming into the year, it looked like that might be the WWF's best shot. That's option A. And when they tried that option and it didn't work, Hogan's comeback was a flop. If you would ask me, okay, how else could the WWF maybe get out of this slump? My answer would be either bring in Sting. And I know he was under contract for WCW, but guys got out of their contracts. Or number two, repackage Lex Luger and make one of those two your next Hulk Hogan. Well, they tried it with Lex Luger and it flopped. And as I've said before, I don't blame Lex Luger. I blame that push. No one was getting over with that Lex Express tour nonsense. And, you know, so they blew through both of my potential fixes. So, yeah, in my opinion, Christian, this was the year that things had gone too far to salvage. And once again, we're looking at, you know, by the end of 93, okay, is Vince's version of pro wrestling, is it an 80s fad that's going away fast? What do you think, Steve? Well, um, I'll try to tackle uh, Danny's question here. Uh, he's asking about, uh, do you think Yokozuna winning the title at WrestleMania was being overshadowed by Hogan winning the title immediately? Was it a Vince move to show Hogan he wanted to stay, or was it a Hogan ego trip? Um, I, I kind of just think that, that that was just simply Vince doing what they typically did, which was, hey, let's 
find a way to send the fans home happy on the biggest show of the year. So where we're us fans watching, we thought that uh, Hogan was there with Beefcake to maybe win the tag team titles from DBS and IRS. And then Hogan comes out at the end and he posed in the ring and he posed with Savage and then he posed with Vince, I guess, at the end. You know, I think that was just a typical let's have Hogan pose at the end of the night and send everybody home happy. Uh, I don't think he was thinking long term of, hey, you know, once we do this, Hogan's going to carry the ball and we're going to go back to business as normal. Because, I mean, how it how it all played out was uh, Hogan and Beefcake went on the road and had a series of rematches with IRS and DiBiase. I know they drew like 6,000 fans in Pittsburgh. Uh, they drew 8,000 of the Spectrum and they drew about 11,000 of the Meadowlands for that feud. And Hogan never really defended the belt uh, again, except for when he would lose the title, the Yokozuna on a pay-per-view King of the Ring, I guess, a few months later. So I, I think it, I think that the booking was just for that one night for WrestleMania to send the f- fans home happy, to have maybe an ESPN moment. But um, I don't think Vince was thinking long term with that. I mean, and you brought up a really good point that, you know, this this was WrestleMania. Like, you want to sh- – the WWS formula was to send everyone home happy, and that's what they did. This was the first WrestleMania I did not watch live, and someone at work the next day come, hey, did you hear what happened? Hogan's the new WWF champion. I was taken aback. What? <laughs> but it, it turns out that the long-term plan was that – uh, they, they went around the horn with the tag team title defenses, and then they the idea was, okay, a summer of Hogan versus Yokozuna, Hogan successfully defending the championship, and then SummerSlam was supposed to be Hulk Hogan against Bret Hart, where Hulk Hogan put over Bret Hart. Supposedly, from what I've heard over the years, Hogan had agreed to do this. He agreed to put Bret Hart over clean at SummerSlam 93. And, you know, th- there's a difference when it comes to Hogan between agreeing to do it and actually doing it. But that all fell apart uh, w- well before the summer began. Just the WWF and Hogan each got really tired of each other in record time. Yeah, and I would just add to that that I, I think long before this year occurred, I think there was a decision made by Vince and his people, whether it was Pat Patterson or wh- whoever his people were at the time, probably J.J. J. Dillon was in there and Bruce Pritchard. I think that they did make a decision to go with Bret Hart as the guy to go forward, and supposedly Tito Santana was considered for that role too. And why they went this convoluted way of having uh, rather than have Brett win strong at WrestleMania and maybe even have Hogan help him to win. And maybe, you know, him Hogan knocking Fuji down when he was trying to throw salt in Brett, Brett's eyes, something like that. I don't know why they had to kind of delay Brett's big push, but you know, as we, as his history is kind of proven, uh, giving Brett the belt uh, long-term was really a good thing. I mean, and he really, brought a new style of wrestling. And I think the people that came after him, the, you know, the Eddie Guerrero's and the Kurt Angles, you know, all, all owe uh, Bret Hart this huge thank you for, for really starting this wrestling trend in the WWF after, you know, what had preceded it. It was funny. I mean, well, a couple of things that Tito Santana story. I have heard that story before that, you know, it was either if it wasn't going to be Brett, it was going to be Tito Santana. I just don't believe that story. Tito had been around for 10 years. He was looking older. I mean, he was out of the company quickly, you know, shortly thereafter. I mean, it, it, to me, it's it's just too large a gap between, OK, we, we no longer need you and we're going to be make you the number one guy. If they saw that in Tito, they would have come up with something for him rather than, you know, showing him the door after 10 years. Um, but number two, I mean, they they. The reason they didn't go with Brett at WrestleMania, they thought Hogan had another top run in him. And it right. turned out it wasn't there. It's funny. We've talked about this on the show before. You know, Hogan having that resurgence in the mid-90s as a heel. I did not see that coming. Like by the middle of 1993, I'm like, okay, the Hogan era is is dead and buried. 
Yeah, yeah, it's amazing to look at it now because not not only did he he do that and did it so hugely successfully, but he even had another baby face run in him around 2002 after the invasion angle. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, it really everything came full circle again. Yeah, and I did, I did not see that coming January 1st, 1993. All right, Steve, your turn to select a question from our audience. All right. Now, this question, it did kind of skew closer to 1992, but uh, I think it's still worth asking. Uh, Nicholas Coliatis asks, what is your overall opinion of the Dangerous Alliance as a stable? And why, with all the talent involved, do you think it doesn't get the recognition it deserves, like the Horsemen, the NWO, or Degeneration X? Well, Casey, what do you think? Um, I think... I think I think it comes down to just one thing. I kind of think that the uh, WCW was a Southern-based promotion, and I think that they were just afraid of pushing uh, Paul Heyman, a New York guy, and pushing him to the moon. Could you imagine if if instead of Paul Heyman, that it had been Jim Cornette? Jim Cornette, surrounded by not only his his close ally Bob Eaton but surrounded by Arn Anderson and Rick Rude and Steve Austin and even Larry Zbysko. I mean, I think, you know, Jim Cornette would have taken these guys to the moon. And I think the promotion would have been afraid to uh, go with it and just, just allow it to be flourish and be a, a amazing success. So that that's what I, what I think of it. I think that uh, WCW just put the brakes on it. I mean, they allowed it to flourish a little bit, but they weren't gung ho about it the way they would have been with a Southern guy like Cornette. I I see it differently. I I, rem- I have fond memories of the Dangerous Alliance. I mean, I thought Paulie Dangerously was great in his role. I, I think Car- Cornette. I'm not. He. I'm not going to call him cartoonish. He is not cartoonish. He never was. But Paulie had that like more savage, aggressive edge. Like he he came across as a little bit deranged, and the kind of guy who would put together something like this. I think Nick. The reason. That it didn't, you know, it's not talked about the way the horsemen were talked about. It's simple. A lot fewer people were watching during the Dangerous Alliance era than they were the Horsemen era. I mean, you know, WCW, despite the fact that they had that, you know, that great rivalry of the Dangerous Alliance versus Sting and his friends, you know, WCW just could never get it right. I don't mean to over oversimplify, but that's really the the answer. Fewer people were watching, and it's WCW. They're, you know, in 1992. They're gonna drop the ball, not maybe. No, I, I think you're. I think you're right on that. Uh, I, uh, but I, I still like my answer as far as Cornette. I, I think. Uh, I, I, th- I think that they. I mean, Heyman with the talent he was given, and these were all like B level guys at the time. I mean, obviously Austin proved to be you know an A lister as time went on. I think they just didn't allow it to flourish the way it could have. I think. I think. Uh, they came close to the, the heights, but it, they could have gone a lot further if, if they had just let it, let it happen. I think they put the brakes on it with uh, Paul Heyman. No, I, I can see that. And Paul was not always the the easiest guy to have around. You know, so he, he supposedly he was always late. He wanted to do his own thing, etc. So, and, and you also have to throw in too that Jim Cornette was. I mean, he was. He had his own promotion. Yeah, he was willing to come in on a limited basis for his friend and mentor, Bill Watts. But, I mean, Smoky Mountain was his priority in 92. Very good point. Yeah, he he would have been unavailable. So, uh, anyhow. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Let me see. Ian Totten asked, was Ric Flair going back to WCW as the man a step backwards for the company at that point? In my opinion, Ian, him going back, returning home after a year and a half in the WWF was a step forward for the year 1993 in a vacuum. And, you know, they – I think people remember Starcade 93 as, you know, I mean – unbelievable wcw sells out a show in a major arena and has a really good pay-per-view you know we were all taken a pleasantly taken aback but we forget that you know rick flair for the most part back to wcw in 1993 was an absolute mess with you know missy hyatt's trying to get in touch with him and he's blowing her off and then they're doing the flair for the gold segments which went nowhere <laughs> um 
it all came out well. And but you know th- there were some there were some mud pies with Ric Flair in '93. Well, I, I would say, I would say that that uh, he had to really get back in the main event mix. I mean, what what would be the point to bring him in and and just throw him back in and say a tag team with Arn and they would go for the the tag straps? I mean, the, I mean the, he he was beloved. It, it would be it would be like having Bruno come back to WWF and have him be in the middle of the card. I mean, there's no sense to it. Um, Flair was kind of like the the legend of that era of the area of the Carolinas. I mean, he has to be back in the main event, and and it was really interesting to see him go up against somebody so mammoth like Vader. I mean, he he didn't really have an opponent like that before, and it made for really an interesting matchup. And when he won that match, uh, it really felt like uh, that everything was kind of right in WCW. Flair's back on top again. You know, he's back home where he belongs, and uh, I'm sure a lot of the Long, uh, long-term long fans that maybe had taken the powder from the company were ready to kind of put their eyes on the product again and give it another chance. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, you know, okay, Ric Flair's back. He's the the number one draw that WCW had. He After a successful run in the WWF, you know, now he's had time to, to get fresh again. So, yeah, you know, to a- answer Ian's question, you know, I thought it was a good short-term thing. But, you know, then again, I mean, by 91, I felt like they had an an over-reliance of Ric Flair. You know what, Steve? I'm going to cheat a little bit, too. Since we're talking about Rick, Marcus Nicholas asks, what if Ric Flair stays with the WWF? What role does he play? Would there have been Flair versus Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania? I mean, in my opinion, Nick Marcus – if you want to know what Ric Flair had, Ric Flair never left the WWF again in early 1993, what his trajectory would have been, look no further than Ted DiBiase's. I think it would have been an exact mirror of what Ted DiBiase did. He was on top for a long time, like, you know, from his debut in summer of 1987 until he did the job, uh, SummerSlam 1988, uh, he was on top. And then Ted DiBiase started moving down the card in f- with feuds against uh, Big Boss Man, Jake Roberts, Tito Santana, etc. And then Ted DiBiase eventually got moved into a tag team, a top tag team, the tag team champions. But I think that's exactly what would have happened with Ric Flair. And no, I, I don't think we would have seen Ric Flair versus Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 9. Your thoughts, Steve? Well, uh, my thought would be definitely, uh, definitely no Flair versus Hogan at WrestleMania. If it wasn't going to happen the first time, it wasn't going to happen you know, a year later. But as far as um, I, I kind of think that, that Vince actually treated him in a special way. I think he treated Flair, he yeah, treated Flair in like a, a different way than he treated other talent. He even treated Dusty. I mean, he, he, with Dusty, it was different. I mean, when Dusty gave notice, he was doing those like 90 second jobs to verge on the way out and stuff like that. I think Vince McMahon had so much respect for what Ric Flair had achieved. I think he just wanted him to do the one TV job for Kerr Hennig. And after that, just go go back to where you belong, go back to WCW. And if, if the opportunity comes along in the future where we can work together again, so be it. Uh, I, I'm sure that Vince had that in the back of his mind that, you know, keeping Flair strong, maybe we could use him again in the future one way or another. But uh, I don't think Vince had any intention of, of making him work uh, lower on the card. I think he was much more happier just sending him back to WCW and letting him kind of rebuild his legacy there. I, I agree. Vince McMahon, you know, if my understanding was that uh, Ric Flair came up to Vince and said, look, you know, I I've had my run at the top here. I'd like to go back. And Vince kind of said, OK, you got to do the honors on the way out. And, you know, everyone was happy. Vince would, was happy to let him go back to WCW and obviously didn't feel like WCW was enough of a threat uh, with Ric Flair. And at the time, I, I totally agreed with Ric with Vince McMahon's line of thinking. I mean, you know, if the guy wants to go home and be happy, let him do it. Steve, you mentioned that uh, Vince McMahon had a, a different level of respect for Ric Flair. And as soon as those words came out of your mouth, I'm like, 
except when Vince is drunk and urinating in, in, into Ric Flair's hotel bed, which is a story that Bret Hart told. So, wow. When Brett told that story, he was on the outs with both McMahon and Flair, and who knows if it's true, but it's in Brett's book. Wow, that, that's pretty hilarious. But <laughs> <laughs> well, anyhow, let me let me segue into another uh, question. Uh, Brian Jones asks, "How would you rate Starcade '93 against Starcade '83 to '88?" Well, how would you rate it, Steve? I, you know, I I think it's very interesting to compare. Um, for one thing, if you're looking at the Starcades from the, the mid 80s, they were set up by the Crockett's to be like their WrestleMania, their their biggest show of the year and kind of a show to have uh, blow off the biggest angles and start new angles, kind of like WrestleMania. Um, Starcade 93, by the time it happened, it was just one of eight different pay-per-views that uh, WCW was offering in that given year. And they did try to put together like the, the best show that they could put on. And it was a good show, I would say, uh, based on you know the other shows of that year. But I, I do have a fondness for those early Starcades, and I'll tell you why. Uh, the first one from 83, you really had the flavor of Mid-Atlantic Wrestling because Mid-Atlantic was really well known for its tag teams. And there was eight matches on that first card and four of them were tag team matches. So you really had that flavor of Mid-Atlantic Wrestling. And it also had that seriousness of the old school wrestling. Like you had matches like uh, Abdul against Carlos Colon. You had the tag team match with Mark Lewin and Kevin Sullivan where uh, Scott McGee like blew a gusher in the second match of the night. So it was much more serious minded in those days. Uh, when Dusty became the booker the year after that, you started to see a lot of the Florida guys that uh, were Dusty's cronies in Florida came into the uh, Jim Crockett promotion scene. And so you had a lot of the Florida flavor, the Dusty guys, D Dusty's posse in there. So by the time Star K93 comes along, you know, we're kind of in the, I guess Ole Anderson would call it corporate wrestling. And you have, uh, you know, Bill Watts is your booker and he did an excellent job, but he doesn't have the flavor of the old school wrestling that I, I really appreciate. Yeah, you know, we were talking about the Facebook group, and someone, uh, Mark Rock and Roland, put up a, a picture of, of Michael Hayes uh, having his concert at the Sportatorium at the beginning of 1988, and Buddy Roberts, you know, has a few too many and winds up ruining Michael Hayes' concert by getting into a brawl in the middle of the concert with the Von Erichs. And, you know, Michael Hayes getting on TV, and, buddy, you got drunk and ruined my concert. And <laughs> that was inconceivable just five years earlier. The guy's having a concert and what? And it just goes to show you if wrestling had changed that much from 83 to 88, it had, you know, it was unrecognizable from 83 to 93. But to answer the question, I thought I thought Starcade '93 was a a good show with a a superb main event. Uh, was it better than like Starcade '83, Starcade '85, '86, '88? No, but it was a a step, absolutely a step in the right direction. Probably better than Starcade '84 or '87. Right. No, I I agree on that. Travis Hitson asked when Paul Roma. Joined the Four Horsemen, this is in 1993, was that the end of the Horsemen being cool? And in my opinion, um, it was not the end. Uh, the end of the Horsemen being cool, I thought, was like 1990 when they brought in Sid. And it was Flair, Sid, Arn, and Barry Windham. And it just it felt like an act that needed to be retired that they kept bringing back over and over again. Bob, but Paul Paul Roma being brought in, I mean, nothing against Roma. It was just that he had been typecast as being this, you know, underneath guy in the WWF for how many years since like 85 and they bring him in and they immediately make him a horseman. I mean, the whole thing was a disaster, but focusing on what Travis asked, I thought the horsemen were uncool before that. Well, my answer is similar to yours. Um, my memory of the uh, horsemen in 1990, I believe uh, 
they, they try to make the horsemen into baby faces for a very brief time. And I think Oli mm-hmm. was even one of the baby faces for a brief while. And he yeah. was. It was Flair, Sting, Oli, and Arn. Yeah, yeah. And, and he, he, he really brought the whole thing down. I mean, you know, you're supposed to look at these guys as this hip, hip group. And, you know, Oli looked like he was 60 years old and like a, some, you know, longshoreman or something. But he, he just, it just didn't really work out with him. And even trying to bring Sting into the group, it just seems so forced. As far as Roma coming in, I, I could see why they were trying to do it. Um, one of the other questions that we had in this uh, exercise, uh, someone had asked about uh, Telly Blanchard uh, coming into the Horsemen at the same time frame, and I think that what happened with that, uh, supposedly they had offered him like a five hundred dollar a night guarantee, which was like you know chicken feed money. Uh, and uh, I think Telly was probably still bent on a shape from when they didn't let him come back to WCW a couple years earlier when Arn came back from his WWF run. So. I can see where they would think, you know, Paul Roma is a good, good talent. You know, he's proved himself with uh, power and glory. Uh, he's, he's definitely a good worker now. Let's, let's put him with our top group and we'll give him the rub and he'll be a star. But it just wasn't meant to be. It didn't work out that way. Steve, I, and this is not 1993, but I really believe that if they had stuck with the babyface horsemen, uh, at the end of, end of 89, early 1990, if they had said, okay, the four horsemen are now good guys, it's Ric Flair, Sting, Arn Anderson, and Brian Pillman, and they're taking on the bad guys, I think that potentially could have been really good business for WCW. But of course, they made the the wrong decision. They let Ric Flair talk them into, okay, let's make the horsemen bad guys again. And, you know, I'll be the one who, who coronates Sting. And it's like, it was just a really bad decision. The WCW fans did not want to boo the four horsemen. And they just ignored that. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think Ric Flair, uh, you know, he, he just uh, I, I think he he felt comfortable in that role that he always was in as far as like being that wrestler that would make other wrestlers look good. And and you know, about a year later from now, like 94, uh, uh, Hogan comes in and and from what I've heard, Hogan asked for Flair to be the one to kind of you know, do the job for him to help him get over in WCW. And Flair was more than happy to do that. And, you know, th- that's good. And, and I mean, obviously now with Ric Flair getting so much attention and the, just the general public uh, in social media, uh, it, obviously doing all these jobs didn't kill him or anything. I mean, he's still uh, very relevant, relevant in today's society, but uh, just from a wrestling standpoint, it just seems like he was too willing to, do jobs or put anybody over or, you know, make uh, the jobbers look good. Uh, It just didn't make sense to me. No, I mean, this will be for a show next year when we talk about 1994. I mean, that Ric Flair versus Hulk Hogan feud, I mean, you know, it sounds good on paper. And, yeah, you want Hulk Hogan to to come out on top in the end. But they made it look like Ric Flair had no chance in this feud. It was like, you know, it was like when the Yankees used to always beat the Red Sox. Like, where's where's the feud? Where's the rivalry if we always know who's going to win and who's going to win big time? You know? So I thought they completely screwed that one up. I'm not saying Flair should have gone over. I'm saying that Flair should have gotten in some offense and Hogan should have made himself look a little bit vulnerable. Yeah. I, I mean, to your point, uh, the, the WWF Flair Hogan matches were actually more compelling than those 94 uh, Hogan Flair WCW matches, which just looked like it was so obvious that Hogan was going to win his wife sitting in the front row cheering him on. And I mean, it just, it just looked like such a, I mean, we we all hate to see wrestling called fake, but God, it looks so fake just seeing him you know, flare yeah. flip flop for Hogan so easily. No, I, I agree with you. After the first two pay-per-view matches where Hogan dominated, what was the, the point in having a third one? But they went ahead and did it anyway. Mm-hmm. All right, Steve, I, I'm going to volley, volley this over to you. What, what would you like to discuss? Which question? Here's one from Richard Conroy. If Flair stayed around to face Hennig at WrestleMania, what would they have done with Luger? Oh, what do you think, Steve? Randy Savage versus Lex Luger. Restraining order on a pole match with Elizabeth in the center of the ring. <laughs> that's that's my call there. 
<laughs> oh man, if we could only see the future in 1993, <laughs> where where Elizabeth is with no less than Lex Luger after everything that all the rumors that had gone on Good before grief. that. I, 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 yeah, you know what? The more I think about it, I don't think they would have done Ric Flair versus Kurt Henning. I don't think they would have. I think they would have settled that before that WrestleMania. Yeah. So I think they they would have had different opponents. Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. Uh, but it, 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 but he was a good uh, guy to ha- finish Flair out with, and and you have a you know you almost could see kind of that symbiotic thing going when when Hennig finally got to WCW, they paired him up with Flair immediately, and they kind of did their horseman thing in in that time frame. For a little while, they tried that. Yep. All right, I'm going to answer a Lance O'Donnell question. We have so many good questions. We're already running out of time. I hate I hate that. But anyway, this is a good question. 1993, Ric Flair returns from his WWF run and is, and is immediately back in the forefront of the world title picture. Should he have been used to finally get Barry Windham into the top guy spot? Steve, I think a lot of people are, are not going to like my answer to this question, but it's what I really think. In 1993, Barry Windham was no longer the Barry Windham of 1986-87. He was no longer the Barry Windham of 1988. He wasn't even the Barry Windham of 1991. I mean, his his knee injuries had gotten serious. He had put on a lot of weight, and it just felt like that opportunity where Barry Windham could have been one of the top stars in the NWA, possibly a long-term NWA champion, that window had closed. I'm not saying that to be you know, mean or cruel to Barry Windham. I know Barry's had some serious health issues uh, over the past couple of months. I certainly wish him well, but... By 1993, to me, it was obvious that the the Barry Windham becoming a superstar, the, that opportunity had come and gone. The ship had sailed, as as they say. Oh, I, I I really agree completely on this one. Um, because I, I I'm just going off my memory. Uh, I seem to remember right at this at the time that that Flair departed for the WWF, and there was the big controversy about you know him taking the belt and all that. Uh, there was a, a major. Uh, WCW pay-per-view at the same time when he departed and it was kind of like almost like a number one contenders main event match of the two guys who were left there once Flair left and I think it was Barry Windham against Lex Luger I think yes it was okay it was so to me that was that was his moment I mean that was his moment to you know take the ball and run with it and I'm sure you know knowing how they book things it was probably a screwy ending and there wasn't it wasn't a definitive winner you know, it's just it's just sad to say, but uh, they should have done something major with Barry in the in the late eighties, or but it just never happened. And you know, by the time the nineties came around, it was just too late. Yeah, and I re- I remember I was actually at that show where they had the Lex Luger and Barry Windham match. You know, number one contenders, uh, winner takes the wins the world championship and Luger came in as a baby face and Barry came in as the heel and they did the double turn and it was Barry who just didn't look really good in the process it was it looked like he was the heel and Luger was the baby face but Luger outsmarted him and you know kind of I don't want to say cheated him out of the title but used uh unorthodox means to win the championship when Harley race and uh, Mr. Hughes came out to assist Luger. You, you know, uh, just taking this in a little bit of a different direction, you know, with the recent news about Barry Windham's health, which was so disturbing and upsetting. Uh, I thought about his, his career arc and, you know, the different things he accomplished. And I know 1989, I think was when he was doing the Widowmaker thing in the WWF. And uh, he was getting this huge push as the Widowmaker, probably about five, six months before the debut of the undertaker. And I think the, the, he per, him personally pulled the plug on it himself because uh, I think his dad and Kendall were going through that that certain thing that kind of got them sent away for a little while. Uh, but uh, the th- thing I was trying to say was, you know, you know, hypothetically, if if Barry had kept his health and stayed in the WWF, which is 
couple of major ifs there. Could you imagine like a long-term feud with Barry Windham still in his prime against The Undertaker? I mean, The Undertaker was still very green in those early days, uh, you know, from being Mark Callis in WCW to to becoming The Undertaker and then slowly getting good in that role. But th- those guys could have had a, a major rivalry if they wanted to over a long period of time. They could have. Had, had Barry stayed on track, you know, it was limitless, but, you know, Barry had this thing where he would burn bridges, quite frankly. And, you know, at some point, you know, when you've burned enough bridges that, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, he didn't wrestle really a style that, you know, could have gotten him over as a major success in Japan. And he, he pissed off Vince. He pissed off WCW. And what are you going to do? You know what, Steve? We'll have – you mentioned Blackjack and uh, Kendall Windham, their issues. I – We'll do a quick extra innings talking about that uh, maybe in about 10 minutes. But <laughs> is it my turn or your turn to, to pull up a question, sir? Well, I, I have one ready for you, so I'll ask you this one. All right, here we go. This is from the great Max Tamale, who's been a uh, host before, a co-host. If the WWF went with Brett versus Savage at WrestleMania 9 with Macho Man playing a subtle heel and putting over the Hitman in the great match that they were capable of having – could Brett have gotten over to a level that would have popped business to the greatest extent? Your thoughts on that, Steve? My thought is uh, we just seen that the year before uh, WrestleMania eight, we had seen yep. uh, Roddy Piper per- perform one of his best matches against Brett. Uh, you know, Roddy, who never really did a major job in a major WWF show, uh, did the job for uh, Brett and really elevated him to that next level. Uh, put him in that main event caliber level. I love Macho Man uh, almost as much as Brandon Rice. Uh, Randy Savage is one of the all-time greats, but sadly, he was already kind of fading out as far as just the, he wasn't putting on those magnificent performances anymore. And even though I'm sure he could have had like a, a good match with Brett, I, and I, I think just him losing so much to Hogan and Warrior and this one and that one, I think his star had been so uh, diminished and devalued. He, he, the, the thing he really needed was to go to WCW and kind of get refreshed. But um, I don't think this was really necessary to get uh, Brett over a little bit more. I think Piper already did that job the year before. I mean, our thoughts are very similar. It it sounds really good in a vacuum. Like, you know, you've got Randy Savage, who Vince McMahon at the time was was taking great care of as, you know, the living legend of professional wrestling. No, not Bruno San Martino, but a living legend, a guy who is going to be, you know, at the top at all times. But again, they they had just did it the year before. And I think the the average WWF's uh, fans' reaction to that would would have been like, "Oh man, we're we're doing this again." The fading <laughs> legend is putting over Bret Hart. Like you know, it would have been a great match, and you know, it it might have been a great idea that okay, Bret has now beaten Randy Savage and Roddy Piper in major WrestleMania matches. But I think after after one year, you're just cutting it a little bit too close, in my opinion. I agree. I like this question. Jerry Joy asked if there is one wrestler you could add to further enhance the Smoky Mountain rest- roster, who would it be? And I, I think I've talked about this on the show before. When Smoky Mountain first started, Eddie Gilbert was conspicuous by his absence. We're like, why is Eddie Gilbert not in this promotion? It's the most obvious thing in the world. And I asked Brian Hildebrand about it, and he just kind of went, uh, I think Eddie and Jim are a little bit too much alike. And you know what that's French for, okay? <laughs> uh, frankly, Jim just didn't want to deal with Eddie's bullshit. But I think, you know, again, he came in eventually and he just was not very good. And Eddie left on bad terms, which is the only terms Eddie was leaving on in the early to mid 90s. And it's a shame what happened to Eddie. But, you know, I was very disappointed when he left Smoky Mountain Wrestling with no notice. I mean, my understanding is Brian Hildebrand really went really went out of his way to try to get Jim Cornette to use Eddie. And when it happened, a, Eddie was disappointing, you know, to begin with, and B, he left with no notice. But to answer Jerry's question, <laughs> Eddie Gilbert, any thoughts on that, Steve? 
Well, I know that's an excellent answer. Um, as far as my answer, uh, and, and again, I was trying to answer this, not really like uh, figuring it like if these guys were, you know, already working other areas or, you know, c contractually obligated elsewhere. Um, the person that I thought of was, was none other than Dusty Rhodes, only because uh, he oh, wow. he had played a, a role in mentoring Jim Cornette and helping him you know, get to the next level. And, 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 you know, you, when you look at Smoky Mountain, you have all these great characters. You have uh, a lot of the people that had been big uh, time players uh, uh, in that area um, for uh, the Fullers, like people like Mongolian Stomper. Uh, Dick Murdoch was even there briefly. So, I mean, w w who better to have together than when Dick Murdoch and Dusty Rhodes, the original outlaws? I mean, that that could have been really uh, slumping to see them together, even though they had been together very briefly in that uh, 1988 WCW when they wrestled the Sheik in Detroit. But, uh, yeah, I, I, that would be my answer, Dusty Rhodes. Steve, I, to this moment, I had never envisioned, I had never looked at the possibility of Dusty Rhodes being part of Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And he was the booker in WCW pretty much the whole time uh, Smokey was around. So he had a, a cushy office job. But I've never conceptualized, like, what if Dusty Rhodes didn't have a job with WCW? Would he have been the top star of Smoky Mountain Wrestling? And I, I've thought about it when it comes to, like, Magnum TA, had he not gotten into the accident – I wouldn't be surprised if he was like one of the top stars in Smokey in 93 or 94. And now we get to the Dusty part. I mean, that would have been so much fun had Dusty been willing to do it and had he been available. Like, I never thought about that before, but that's pretty crazy. And my understanding is that when Dusty, uh, he tried to run his own promotion in Florida in 1989, and he lost a lot of money doing it. And, you know, he needed a job with Vince McMahon in, in 1990 when he came in, 1991. So if he still theoretically needed a job and Smoky Mountain paid its baby faces pretty well, I mean, why not? The houses would have gone up with Dusty, no question. Oh, oh yeah. And, and, you know, looking back on how history played out, uh, uh, when when WCW finally closed his doors for good, Dusty went back on the road. He, I mean, he wrestled in ECW for a while. Uh, yes. He wrestled a lot of independent dates. Uh, I mean, it's it, like you said, he, he had lost so much money in 1989 in that Florida championship wrestling incarnation. He he made a ton of money working for Vince in those polka dot years of 89 to 90 or so. But, you know, that was only like two years worth of income. And, you know, he had kids and family and properties he had to pay for. So, yeah, I think I think uh, it would be very cool to see Dusty in that role, uh, especially since the roster was so filled with so many of the, his contemporaries that he had worked with in the past. It would have been very interesting to see. That that would have been something else. And again, I, I I never even thought about the possibility of Dusty being part of Smoky Mountain, but that would have been really cool. All right. You, you, what, one more question from you, Steve. OK, I found a good one and, and I really want to hear your answer on this one. It's, I've got a good answer on this one, too. Sonny Martinez asks, Raw began in 1993. So I'll ask a general question. Is Raw the most important television show in wrestling history? I think the only question is, I mean, what is the number two most important television show in wrestling history? I mean, it's, to me, it's it's clearly Monday Night Raw. Um, the, the the only question is, you know, is Nitro number two? Even though it was it was short lived, but it had such an impact on the wrestling business. Or is it SmackDown? Because SmackDown's been around for over 25 years. Um, but I think Raw is is clearly number one. I, I couldn't even tell you what number two is. I mean, you know, the, the WTBS 605 show, I mean, way – I mean, Raw was just way more important. Uh, even the WWF syndicated show, Superstars of Wrestling – Raw was just way more important. I mean, it's, it's Raw number one, and the, the discussion starts with who's number two. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you my answer, and you're gonna laugh at first, but let me tell you why I'm going with this answer. So, well, Steve, I'll tell you. Can I cut you off real quick? Yes. My answer is for United States and Canada only. There, if you want to talk about Japan shows, sure. 
you might have more important ones, but mine's for uh, domestic shows only. I, I, I apologize, Steve. Go ahead. So, so I'm going to a- answer this question. There, he's asking, what's the most important television show in wrestling history? So my answer is Saturday Night Live. And now let me explain that. Okay. So, so yeah, Saturday Night Live. And the reason is that when WrestleMania 1 happened, uh, according to you know things I've read about and heard, you know, Vince had already canceled a whole ton of locations for the closed circuit. They really didn't know if it was going to be a success or a failure. But that night before WrestleMania, that Saturday night uh, on NBC, uh, when and when Saturday Night Live was still a very hot, popular show that got huge ratings, uh, they aired this airing of the show, which had Hulk Hogan and Mr. T and even had a small appearance by Roddy Piper and Bob Orton and Orndorff. But this show was essentially uh, an infomercial for the WWF, and and it was. As, as history has played out, it took that show, which which if, if people were on the fence about, oh, should I should I go, should I get it or not, or should I go to it, it really pushed a lot of people into the yeah, we got to see this, you know, we got to see what, what this is about, and and you know, as history has told us now, uh, WrestleMania was a big success, bigger than what they had thought, and and. Because of that, and and, and uh, due to a little bit because of the TNT show on USA Network, uh, Dick Ebersol decided, hey, let's let's have Vince do these shows, these Saturday Night Main Event shows. And so where I'm getting it the most important is because in this time frame, like 85, 86, WCW, or sorry, Jim Crockett Promotions and the WWF were neck and neck in this battle to see who's going to survive, who's the, the biggest promotion. And and to me, that was what really kind of took them over the top, uh, getting on NBC, you know, doing these shows every month, you know, with Hulk Hogan featured every month. And, and essentially it led up to WrestleMania three and 87, which was the juggernaut of all wrestling shows. And that really took them over the top over JCP. And that's was the, how the history books wrote everything after that. Steve, you know what? I am glad to have you as the semi-regular co-host on Stick to Wrestling. And one reason is we don't agree on everything. And I, I respectfully disagree with what you just said, because I don't think a lot of people, uh, saw Hulk Hogan and Mr. T on Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live and said, you know what, I'm, I think I'm going to do tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> I'll, I'll do this thing. I think people more or less already had their minds made up. And it just turns out that when it comes to uh, closed circuit or, yeah, closed circuit, People tended not to buy tickets in advance. They tended to buy them the day of the show, and Vince didn't realize that, which is why the WWF was canceling so many locations. And, you know, I I mean, I know I bought mine in advance, but, you know, that's typically, from what I understand, how closed circuit worked. So what it it basically turned out to be is Vince – closed a lot of locations that, frankly, might have been successful for him. That's true. That's very true. All right. So I'll tell you what, we've been at it for an hour. I want to thank everyone who sent in a question. I'm sorry if we didn't get to yours, but we had a lot of really good ones. Steve, I'll tell you what, here's the extra innings I wanted to do with you, right? And this is something you brought up, Blackjack Mulligan. Let me give everyone the background story. Blackjack Mulligan and Kendall Wyndham got caught trying to sell a an FBI agent I Steve I'm fuzzy about the numbers but I don't want to I want to say it was a hundred thousand dollars of counterfeit cash for like 50 for like five thousand dollars so they both went to prison for it right Steve let's throw out a number let's say 10 to 1 ratio right mm-hmm. you can turn two thousand dollars of regular cash into twenty thousand dollars of counterfeit cash would you do it and more well first of all would you do it no i i uh, i i know that crime doesn't pay i learned that from batman 1966 <laughs> from watching <laughs> kid <laughs> very so true. no no you would do it like was it would it be like a kind of a morals thing or i'm going to get caught thing both okay now t- to me it wouldn't be a morals thing it would be i'm going to get caught and here I, I've been talking about this with friends back and forth ever since that happens. Like if you could turn like, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, two thousand dollars into 20 grand, would you do it? My question is, OK, how do you spend this 20 grand now? 
if you're running around spending it in the same city, you're going to get caught. <laughs> if if you like dole out a thousand dollars a year, you know, and, and spread it out, like what's the point of even having the 20 grand when you're still spending it 20, 20 years later? And once again, you're still worried about getting caught. Like I, I can't imagine. And maybe someone, you know, come to the Facebook group. If you're like a counterfeit money expert, you know how to take care of this. I mean, to me, it's like, okay, you know, spend a hundred dollars at the grocery store. They're going to find out that that hundred dollar bill was a phony. And then the same one comes up at the mall and the appliance store, and they're going to figure out who you are. So that's why I've never understood the whole counterfeit money thing. I, I just wonder with uh, Blackjack Mulligan, who had been in the business for such a long time after uh, trying to be a football player for a brief period of time, you know, the, the mentality in wrestling, everybody's a mark, everybody's stupid, you know, we can talk in cafe, blah, blah, blah. I wonder yeah. if that kind of contempt for the audience uh, led him to think that he could outsmart whoever and, and you know, get this money so easily. As It sounds like they didn't really uh, think uh, much of what was going to happen. Uh, and, of course, that everything blew up in their faces. That you know what, Steve, that you really said a lot right there because a lot of the guys they have contempt for their audiences, that therefore they have contempt for the rest of the world. And you know, yeah, I'll I'll get five grand from this mark or whatever the, the, the amount was for this money that I printed off, and oh no, he's an FBI agent. Yikes. Right, right. And then you have to pay the piper, yep. Yeah, exactly. And they certainly did. Kendall did not look good when he was coming out of the joint. But Steve, this is our first episode with you as the semi-regular uh, co-host. And really, I mean, excellent episode and a guy I could lean on because, again, I have a cold and I'm not at my best. And You really helped out this episode. Thank you. Well, John, uh, unless you did, told us about it, we wouldn't have known otherwise. But uh, it's, it's a, a great uh, pleasure being with you here again and uh thank you to brian last and lou and the people at arcadian vanguard for allowing me to be here with you and it was it was like uh, like every time it's a lot of fun doing it and we look forward to the next time we definitely do and yeah i want to thank everyone for listening every week i appreciate it happy 2023 once again i want to thank brian last for giving me this podium i want to thank lou kippelman for all of the great work he does week in week out producing this show and this has been a production of the arcadian vanguard podcast network we'll see you next week this concludes our podcast day 